Hi, I'm Jay Tuck. I'm 67 years old, and perhaps this is a good time to look back on my life, make a few assessments. These autobiographies that you're going to see, uh, they were all touched off by a little audio cassette that I found in an old drawer on my desk. It was a, an interview my mother did with her mother, my grandmother, Hetty Mae Cox. Hetty Mae was an eyewitness of one of the worst natural catastrophes ever to hit the United States. This is her eyewitness story. The Galveston flood of September 7, 1900 was one of the worst natural disasters ever to hit the United States. Some 10,000 people died in a single weekend. This is the eyewitness account of one of the survivors, Mrs. Hetty Mae Cox, my grandmother. Tell me about when you got up that morning. We'd had sort of a high tide, so we had a lot of water on the street that morning when we got up, and we all had on our bathing suits. Well, had the water actually come up from around the bay? No, this was a Gulf from Mexico. It was just a high tide from wind, but the wind wasn't at a hurricane stage. So we played around in it that morning, and then, of course, it got worse. The afternoon, as near as I can remember, I would say around 3 o'clock, it got really very bad. They did have a weather bureau, and the, they did not have any forecast. Nobody had telephones, anything like that. There's no way, there was no communi way to communicate with anybody. Rain was pouring down, and we, it, it, the water kept, did come up faster, you see, as the wind blew. And my mother said, well, let's go upstairs. We had a two-story house. And we went up the stairs, and we looked up at the sky, and there wasn't any roof on our house. In Galveston, a tram line used to connect Bath Avenue and Beach Line. For five cents, passengers could enjoy a trolley ride along the surf. During the storm, the waves destroyed the tracks, and the wood trestles became a deadly battering ram destroying street after street as terrified residents fled inland. And we went next door because that was what we called a high-raised cottage. It was about 10 feet off the ground and they had them enclosed with like a lattice work around. They didn't have cellars. We thought, my mother thought, well, the water wouldn't go up. Our house was only about three feet off the ground before, you know. And I guess she thought that would, the water would not go up that high. So we went over and got in that house, and we hadn't been in there any time. And the water came in there. Mm -hmm. And we, the uh, only thing I remember in that house was climbing up on a door. I had told you I had a little yellow dog named Texas, and I had Texas under my arm, and he was a little pooch, and I wouldn't put him down. <laughs> And so my mother made me put the dog down. And I always remember he just swam away, you know. And of course the dog could swim. <laughs> but here I was carrying this five or six extra pounds. During the storm, the waters of the Gulf of Mexico were not clear as artists of the time depicted them. They were covered by a thick layer of churning wooden boards and beams deadly debris grinding in the high-pitched waves of the hurricane. And I got out that window, but I don't think they, my family got out, because I never saw them after that. So I felt that the, the place had collapsed, you see, and I got out on this pile of lumber, which it was. When I had sense enough to think back, I just realized that they were 
just trapped in it, and I was in, I got out. The wind blowing and great big things like doors flying in the air, I can see a, still see a, like a door coming through like this, you know, through the air. I was lying down flat, and I think, because I was caught under some of the wood, and my one leg was completely caught underneath, and I couldn't move, so I was lying down, and I think that's the only reason I was saved. If I'd been up or standing up, I'd have been hit and knocked off into the water. When I came to, I was lying down. My clothes were practically off me. I didn't have anything on. All I could remember was sort of a little skirt that was part of my bathing suit, and it uh, was red. For when I did first realize where I was, it, uh, the rain was coming down very hard. And there was one person I only met one person that whole night and it was just, I thought it was a little boy who was sort of drifting by on another part of this wood and I remember asking him where he was going and, and uh, he said he didn't know and I said what was I going to do and I said I guess I'm going to off and die like everybody else. So then when I did come to, there was a moon shining. And so I could look up and, and here was this lovely bright night. I don't know how long it was, but the people that rescued me said it was about three o'clock in the morning. In the meantime, the water had gone down. Two men came along that picked me up and talked to me. They couldn't carry me but they helped me, walked me along on top of this, and we finally came to a clear spot in the water. And there was a telephone post or some, a pole or something big like that, and they stood me up on it, and they held me, and then they pushed me along, and the water, as I remember, it seemed to be about a foot deep. And they took me to their house, which was not too far from where we were found, about the only house standing in that whole area. And it was one of those, what they called high-raised cottages, as I remember, that so they gave me a, a, a piece of cheese and some, a piece of some pineapple. They probably used everything in the house to give to all the other people. And I, all I remember was that the cheese or the pineapple tasted like kerosene. Isn't it funny how you can remember such foolish little things? And they took these raggedy clothes off and one lady in there, I never did find out her name, had a black skirt, you know, just a plain woman's skirt. And they just put that around my neck and pinned it with a safety pin. And then they gave me this little bit of food they had, and I wanted to get your arms out. I didn't need to. I went right to sleep. I asked them if the they wouldn't take me to the Ursuline convent where I'd been going to school, you see. And of course the convent was full. It's an enormous building that convent was. It was a whole, whole block long and they just were filled with people. So I guess they just sent somebody down. You could get around. There weren't anything to ride in, but you could walk. How could they ever break the news to you about your family? After I'd been at the convent for a couple of days, They'd begun to, uh, they rigged up a little uh, hand printing press in town. And they got word around to places where there were people, refugees, and to ask if they'd please report the names of all the refugees to the paper so they could publish it. The first thing I knew was my uncle came to get me and to convent. Hetty May's father was a brave man named Walter Bruce Tuckett. He didn't survive the storm. Here he is pictured with his daughter, my grandmother, just weeks before the hurricane hit. You mentioned how your father had been away at the time. Well, he was trying to get home. And, and 
he was working he downtown. To be home and like well, they couldn't get, get through. And this uncle and aunt, they tried to get through. You couldn't, you see, there was no warning. No, my father, I found out that this uh, got as far as almost the house that I was picked up in. And so, and it was a grocery store, and they even took the horse in. Katie was the name of the horse. And Katie was taken in too, but they, it, that building went down, they were all lost. My cousin's body was the only one that was recovered. My uncle had gone to the morgue every day and to try to find some of it. Well, you see, that it was in September and it's very hot in Galveston. And they started taking the bodies out to sea and dumping them. And the tides would bring them back. Oh, wow. So they couldn't do that. And they had to, thinking of typhoid and all those things. So they had to burn bodies. And they had to burn all this rubbish because this, these, all this debris that was around and many bodies were in that. So that's why they never found anybody but Lorraine was the only one that was found. It was something like 2,000 people? 10,000. 10,000? Oh, it was terrible. In fact, they said they were, it was worse than that. They never knew. It, they never, there was no way to count it at all. Hetty Mae Cox later married a Texas Railroad executive and grew up to live a privileged life in Port Washington, New York. Her daughter, my mother, Margaret Cox, married the New York newspaper reporter Jane Nelson Tuck. It was my mother who interviewed Grandma for this eyewitness report on the Great Galveston Flood of 1900.